we talked about it last time because it was applicable. Um, we were talking about overcoming in the end times and during the times of tribulation and, and, and persecution and so forth. And we're going to be talking about it in a slightly different way that's kind of uh, more applicable. Well, I shouldn't say more applicable, but just as applicable, applicable on a daily basis, right? So how do we overcome daily? Because that's, that's important, right? How to overcome daily, because that, that can be quite um, challenging, difficult, if we don't have the proper mindset and the proper heart set and the proper connection with God. So first, you know, we have to get our minds right. It's all about getting your mind right, because we know the majority of the battle that takes place takes place between our ears. It's Satan speaking into one ear, the demon speaking into one ear, our flesh speaking in from the inside, and then we have the Spirit of God that dwells on the inside of us speaking uh, again in, in the other ear. So we've done messages on that about an unyielding mind, about a mind that's not willing to cooperate with God, a mind that's not willing to change, a mind that's not willing to bow down before Him, a mind that exalts itself and believes itself to be superior uh, to the Word of God and, and thereby nullifies the Word of God and thereby renders it powerless in their life. Um, so we know that we have to get our mind right, right, and we know that accepting Christ and becoming a believer is just part of the process, just part of the process. The other part of the process is having our mind transformed. And so we have to have this transformation process where we begin to think like God because God is changing our mind to think like Him, right? It's not something we can do on our own accord. It's our own, out of our own volition. It's out of His strength and out of His power. So we have this application of the mind, and then we have the other application of the Spirit. Now, the spiritual application is that which we get rid of the things in our life that have ties to, uh, uh, to the evil and to negativity and to demonic and to the fleshly uh, lures and trappings of this world. So we get rid of the world and the things in the world because the Bible says we're called to be in the world but not part of the world. Amen? So we're here. We can't really help it. Right? There's not really much we can do about it. So let's just make the best of it while we're here. But while we're here, we're not to call it. We're not you know, called to join the camp of the enemy, right? So we're not called to join the camp of the world, we're, and we're definitely not called to believe the lies of the enemy, which are profound, which are many, and they continue to pour it and dump it into us and dump it into us. And, you know, and there's so many lies that have just been perpetuated for so long a period of time that even people, that's why the Bible says, even in the end, the elect will be deceived. But I'm going to tell you, we're in the end, and the elect are deceived, they are deceived. Why? Because what they believe and what they profess and what they state does not line up with God's word. And you can show it, but they don't care because this says being deceived, they will being deceived themselves, they'll go on deceiving others. They don't know it, and so they continue on that path. And then we have division in the house of God. And well, it's not really division because the Bible said a house, what? Divided against itself cannot stand. So if God's house is divided, does that not simply make sense that it's not divided actually? That it's just not that that, that which is separate or apart from God is not of God. God, not with God. Is it not simple? So we have a message on that called division. So we understand then there's the physical application to our spiritual walk with Christ, which is walking not after the lust of our flesh, our own purposeful desires, the things that we want and the things that we feel like we need, but walking out what he says he has in store for us, walking out what he desires for us and making sure that we, we treat ourselves physically as the temple of God because he dwells on the inside of us. So making sure that we exercise, making sure that we, you know, just the, some of the physical things, exercise, the food, diet and water, making sure those things are kind of uh, taken care of, making sure we're getting enough sleep. You know, listen, sleep, uh, it's not overrated. We need it, right? And when you're younger, you can, when you're younger, you can get away. It's kind of a weird thing, right? So when you're younger, you can sleep for long hours and long period of time, right? I mean, I don't know if you were, but some of you can, right? Right. But I remember, like, for example, I, I remember when I was in college. I mean, of course, we stayed up for long periods of time. But nonetheless, I mean, I could sleep for 12, 14 hours and that wouldn't be a problem. Right. I can't do that anymore. Even if I had the whole day to myself, which is pretty much never going to happen again. But <laughs> even if I had the whole day to myself. Right. And I had nothing to do. There's no way I could lay in bed for 14 hours. Just, it'd just be impossible. I mean, after eight hours, I mean, if I get six hours, I'm, I, man, that was a great night, you know? Minister Melissa gets four hours. It's still a bad night, but at least you got four, right? So we, we need to get as much as we can because if you don't get sleep, um, believe it or not, even scripturally speaking, if you don't have enough sleep, then the enemy is, has greater access to you because your defenses are not heightened. 
right? Because you're not at your peak. You're not at your optimal level. You're not at peak performance. And then the flesh can begin to rise up on the inside. So uh, obviously I'm not, this isn't part of today's message, but obviously somebody in here and a lot of people in here probably need to hear it. You know, they used to recommend eight hours was the amount of sleep that you need. Now they've changed that and they said, no, we were wrong. Imagine that. <laughs> it's not eight hours, it's 10 hours is the recommended amount of sleep per day. Right? They say 10 hours is the minimum that you need. Okay, now listen, if you've been shooting for eight and you've been getting six, why don't you shoot for 10 and maybe you'll get eight? <laughs> right? So try to try and work it out. But try to go to bed a little bit earlier. Um, I'm, I'm preaching to myself now. <laughs> try to go to bed a little bit earlier because if you can go to bed a little bit earlier, and I've been doing that, uh, thank goodness lately, Madison's been wanting me to go to sleep earlier so, uh, she, and, and go to sleep, but she goes to sleep, so that's been something like, uh, but it's only 1130 you know, it's only 1030. I, I can't go to sleep yet. It's not two. Um, so, but I've been doing it. And uh, man, I tell you what, eight o'clock comes in the morning. Now it feels a whole lot better. So get some rest, get some sleep, treat your body the way it needs to be treated so that you can be used throughout the day. Because if you don't have enough fuel, if you don't have enough energy and you don't have enough uh, mental capacity throughout the day to, to, to handle your business, then how are you going to handle God's business? How, you, how is he going to use you? So we have to overcome our flesh. We have to overcome temptations. We have to overcome the lies of the enemy. We have to understand that we struggle. And the Bible says that we, uh, we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against wickedness and evil high places, they were against spiritual powers, against demons, against all these things. So we're not warring against man, but we're warring against spiritual wickedness. We're warring against Satan and the enemy. We're warring even against the, our flesh, our old sin nature from which we came out of, right? That old man trying to take us back over and bring us back into sin and old mindsets and old things. And, and some people are even still trapped in the past. They hang so tightly, they refuse to change, they refuse to repent, they refuse uh, to adhere to what the Word of God says because th then that would mean they would have to change and they don't want to change. And we know how people resist change, right? Some people just do not want to change. They're afraid of the change because they would have to humble themselves and then they'd have to repent and then they have to admit that they were wrong and then that's pride standing in the way. So then you have the, the people, not only that, but then also we know that people don't want to, if they'd have to change, then they would have to recognize the very fact that they would be judged if they didn't change. And nobody, especially of the flesh, the flesh, the flesh absolutely detests, it loathes judgment, right? That's why Satan has perpetuated that false teaching, judge not lest ye be judged. Now, don't, don't, don't misquote, I'm not misquoting the scripture. The Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged, but it's in proper context. So we have the teaching on that. Remember the scripture, it says that don't, not to judge your brother unless you first remove the speck out of your own eye, right? So having removed the sin out of your life and having repented of your sin and having walked with Christ, now you're called to. If you don't judge your brother, the Bible says, and you share and you participate in the sin with him. So as a body, it says we're not called to judge the world. That's God's job. So if somebody's not in the house of God and they're not a brother or sister in Christ, we're not, we're not called to condemn them to hell. We already know they're going to hell. Why do you need to tell them? I mean, why do you need to condemn them? Our job is to try to save them, try to pull them out of the burning house. Our job is to try to bring them into light through love and through gentleness and when required boldness. But, but ultimately, it's to be that example of Christ. So we have to uh, be careful of how we walk. The Bible says be careful how we walk because the days are evil. Because we're walking in a world that is a fallen world, and the God of this world is still active, and he's still powerful. Satan hasn't lost any of his power. He's still powerful. He's just not all powerful. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Let's look at what overcome means according to this definition. It says to get the better of in a struggle or conflict, to conquer, to defeat, to overcome the enemy, to prevail over opposition, a debility, to prevail over temptations, uh, to surmount, to overcome one's weakness, to overcome one's sin. To overpower, overwhelm in body or mind, as, as does a liquor, a drug, exertion, or emotion. I was overcome with grief. I was overcome with sleep. I was overcome with exhaustion, right? Uh, the archaic usage of the term is to overspread or overrun. I want you to take a little bit note of that, to overspread. Okay, that word overspread, because we're going to look at that later. Remember now... Satan, from the beginning, tried to overcome. He tried to 
There was a conflict he tried to conquer, he tried to defeat, he tried to prevail over through the use of temptation, he tried to surmount and to overcome one uh, with their weaknesses. And the Garden of Eden is where it began, and we know that, where he came first to Eve. And he says, listen, eat of this fruit, and you will know, you will have knowledge, and you will be like God. Eat of this fruit, and you will have knowledge from the tree of knowledge, and you will become like God. You will become a God. Surely you will not die. That is, was the initiation and the institution of every false religion known to this very day. Every uh, false religion believes that very fact, that they can become God or they can become like a God. Right? So we don't need to get into it. I have the message on that called religions where you can look at the, the comparison between them all. But again, you can look at anything from, you know, uh, what's commonly being kind of raised up like Mormonism, right? And Mormonism, you know, obviously, well, women, I'm sorry, like I've told you before, you, you get to make spiritual babies for, for all eternity. Men, you get to be God over your own planet, all right? Uh, so Mormonism perpetuates that. <laughs> Um, obviously, as, you know, as it came from masonry. And then, obviously, we see, you know, going back even to more kind of New Age, occultic uh, kind of religions, like the one that uh, Tom Cruise is uh, pretty much in charge of, the high priest, high priest Tom Cruise. Um, you know, about, was it five years ago, they uh, said that um, he's now been elevated, the, the leader of their, I don't know what they call the guy that's the leader of their organization, but they said that Tom Cruise has now been elevated to the, to the uh, level of miracle worker. Level he's a, he's a miracle worker in, in, in that particular religion. Um, so, and the name of the religion escapes me. What was it? Scientology, yeah, see, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, L. Ron Hubbard. So, um, anyhow, so Satan uses that ploy that we can become like God, we can become God, and that we will not be judged, and surely we will not die. Remember, the Bible says the wages of sin are? death. So obviously if we sin, we die. But who do you say? Surely you can sin, you will not die. So no man wanted judgment. And then he said that we want to live. So we have knowledge that it is supposedly is going to lead us and, and deter us and, and get us to a place where we um, can bypass God's judgment and we can have uh, the life that Satan promises. Who wants to buy that package, right? No, well, no one. So he told us that we're not going to die. He told us we could become like a God. And the Bible tells us that we have to overcome Satan. We have to overcome the world. And we're going to talk about that later, maybe in Bible study, about overcoming, uh, and, and again, another relation. But the Scripture clearly indicates to us that we must overcome. Because the Bible says, to him who overcomes, I will grant. To him who overcomes, will sit at the table with me. To him who overcomes, he shall inherit the crown of life. To him who overcomes. And he keeps saying that. Now, if he says, if you don't overcome, you perish. So if you don't overcome, you die. You face the second judgment. If you don't overcome, if you don't conquer sin, if you don't conquer Satan, if you don't conquer your daily struggles, if you don't conquer your own mindset and the things that the enemy is trying to dump into your mind, if you don't conquer them, then you will perish. You will die. They will consume you. They will eat you. You will, you will be overcome instead of being an overcomer. That's something that we have to fight on a daily basis, but we have to know who our enemy is, right? So our enemy is the old man. Our enemy, again, is flesh. Our enemy is also Satan. And Satan is not uh, omnipresent, so Satan uses our flesh against us, and he uses and assigns demons to us, just like God assigns angels to us. Satan assigns demons to us at our birth. So we have these demons that follow us around, and they continually, uh, we let them in when we open the door, and the open door is always sin. The Bible says, be careful that you give no room to the enemy. No room to inhabit you. So we have to be, make sure of that. So we know that we need to overcome the world, but Christ speaking, and I'm going to use the Amplified Bible, or actually John speaking this, uh, in 1 John chapter 4, the Amplified Bible says, Little children, you are of God, you belong to Him, and have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because He, being Christ, who lives in you is greater, mightier than he who is in the world. This is something that you have got to tap into, right? 
So we talked about all the time how religion is dead and how religion is just, you know, decorative on the outside. You go through all the motions and traditions and all that, but there's no power to it whatsoever, you know, Christ speaking. There's nothing, there's nothing to it. It's just a dead corpse. So we need relationship. If you're in relationship and you have Christ on the inside of you and you know how to access Christ and you know how to access the throne room of God, you know how to tap in, you know how to pray, and you know how to hear his voice, and he not only do you speak to him, but he speaks back to you and you're in that type of relationship, then the scripture says he who is in you, he who dwells on the inside of you is greater than he who is in the world. Well, who's it referencing? Satan and the demons, them. He who is the Antichrist or of the Antichrist spirit. Now, you have to remember the Antichrist is not just one single individual. It's one individual person, but there are many antichrist spirits that have gone out into the world that inhabit man. Now, these antichrist spirits are ones who deny that Christ is the son of the living God and are directly opposed to him in any manifestation, any way, shape, or form, right? They're opposed to Christ. And this antichrist spirit, by the way, um, gets very, you'll know if it's in somebody if you have discernment, number one. But even if your discernment is not yet there because of your relationship with Christ is not yet there, uh, and you don't have enough of that, 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 um, uh, him on the inside of you, you haven't connected because you're a, a new Christian, you can still tell if it's in them because the minute you bring up Christ to somebody, they get angry. You don't have to preach at them for five minutes. You don't have to do anything. You can just mention you could say Jesus, or you could say Yeshua, or you could just mention, you know, uh, something about Christ, something about God, something about the Son of the living God. You mention something about it, all of a sudden it's like they change, they snap, something happens inside, and all of a sudden they're angered by it. They're frustrated by it. They're frustrated by you. And now all of a sudden what? They come and, and, and then they try to, to put you down, and they try to, uh, they, the, the Bible says, well, they hated me first, Christ speaking says they hated me first, so they're going to hate you. It says that you're going to be hated for my name's sake. So we know that that's going to occur, and we see that that's there, but because of the pressure from the world, because I've got to tell you, there are more unbelievers, more uh, antichrist spirits in the world than there are followers. The Bible says the whole world has been deceived. Christ said that he's coming back for what? His little, little flock. It's just a small group. It says, narrow is the way and few who will find it. There are not many. There's not a lot. And he gives us the definition, and he gives us the understanding of who it is that will be saved. And the majority of those professing Christians will not be saved because they don't adhere to the Word of God. They want the Savior, but they don't want the King. The accuser of the brethren, whom is Satan, tries to overcome us, to defeat us, to conquer us, and we know that he tries to, to defeat us and conquer us on a daily basis with condemnation. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. That, you know that uh, he tries to say, well, your past, the sins of your past will come back to haunt you. And that they, they, you know, that, they look, remember what you did. Remember who you were. Remember what you were like. And remember what you said. God's not going to forgive you. God's not going to do that. What you did was so horrible. He'll never love you. You're not going to be saved. And all these things that he keeps bringing up from your past. Guilt, he keeps placing back upon you, and he puts that spirit of heaviness back in on the inside of you when you accept it and believe it. And now all of a sudden you start becoming depressed and overwhelmed and guilt-ridden. Guilt-ridden, you ever thought about that word? It's like a monkey on your back, guilt-riding you, right? Can't shake it off. And it's just there, strangling you, choking you, weighing you down until you are depressed. The enemy comes with fear. Tries to make you afraid. Fear is what? Lack of faith. Lack of faith is unbelief. Not believing what God says. See, it's so critically important not just to be a believer but a follower. We know that. So we have to follow after Christ and pick up our cross daily and not believe the lies of the enemy. And so the enemy's second objective is to, uh, uh, to kind of speak lies into you. Not only about who you are and try to diminish you and try to break you down, but even to get you to follow after the lies that he's pushing, that he's generating, the counterfeit truth. So we understand that these things are taking place, but we understand that we have to overcome Satan, amen? We have to overcome him and not let him overcome us on a daily basis. Consider the scripture, Romans 12, 21. It said, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Now, I want you to take, take this in a different way on today than I've, I've taught it in the past. Do not be overcome by evil. Okay? So what we're saying here is do not let Satan overcome you today. Do not let him overcome you. Don't let him conquer you. Don't let him defeat you. Don't give any room to him. Don't bow down to him. Don't let your anger rise up. Don't let your flesh rise up. Don't believe the lies that he's spewing in his ears. Don't believe the, the enemies that are surrounding you. Don't believe that they're going to kill you. Don't believe that you're going to die. Don't believe that these things are going to happen to you. Don't believe that. Don't let him overcome you and overtake you. Don't let that happen. Do not stand firm. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand. Stand your ground. Don't back down. We have to stand and we have to fight. We know it's not through our strength, but through the strength of Christ in whom we are able to prevail. So don't be overcome. Don't let Satan overcome you. Now, when you think about this term overcome, I want you to think of, uh, of also kind of like this idea and concept of overshadow, right? So I, I don't know. You can think about it in a multitude of ways, but just think of it maybe for simplistic purposes. Like, you know, we, we, everybody's got, you know, these red cups around here, right? So just think if you're like this little G.I. Joe doll and then Satan's overcoming you and he's encompassing you and he's surrounding you and all of a sudden now you're on the bottom of this cup and what? You're surrounded by darkness. Now you feel overcome. Now you've been, but you have become because you've allowed that to happen. You have become subject to him because now he is controlling you because now you're walking in darkness and not in the light. Christ says, I am the light, right? It's the marvelous light. It says, he says, put on what? The armor of light. Put on the armor of light, which overcomes the darkness. So put on Christ so that he can't overcome you. So it says here, do not be overcome by evil. Don't let him come back over you, but overcome evil with good. Now, can you just take one O out of there? But overcome evil with God. That's how you overcome it. Through his strength, through his might, through who he says he is, through the profession of your mouth, through speaking out against these things. No, I'm not worthless. I reject that. I'm a son of God. You're broke. You ain't got no money. You ain't, you know, you know, you're worthless. You don't have anything. Blessed are the poor. For they are rich in the spirit. See, everything the devil tries to throw at you, we got it, we got it, you know, he's just trying to, to nail you with something, right? But we, we got a word for him. Amen? Matter of fact, we got a whole lot of words on a whole lot of pages in a whole book we can use. And Christ validated the book when he used them to when he, the devil, was speaking to him. He said, go ahead, turn that stone into bread. The Bible says you should not live, live off bread alone. He said, do not tempt the Lord thy God. That's how Christ, Christ validated himself his own word, through speaking the word back to the enemy, we have to learn how to do that. That's why it's so important to not only, we've said this a million times, it's so important not only to know the written word, but to know the living word, right? To be in relationship, because unless you're in relationship, you, the word is powerless. So he wants to overcome us with all these things, so we have to learn how to stand and fight, and we have to learn how to uh, overcome evil. Now, I want, can we flip it, Right? Can we flip it so all of a sudden now the devil is trying to overcome us and put us in darkness. We put on the armor of light and all of a sudden the darkness flees and we've overcome him. We've conquered. We've won. We're victorious. I'm walking today in victory. He, come, he can come at me tomorrow. That's okay. I now know that when he comes at me, I know what I need to do. I'm not going to believe his night lies. I'm not going to accept the guilt. I'm not going to allow them to tell me who I am. I'm going to receive who he says I am. And I'm going to walk in that light, and I'm going to put that armor on, and I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I'm going to stand, and I'm not going to back down, and I'm going to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the living God. Amen? Amen. So we've got to learn how to do this on a daily basis. Daily. Has anybody ever felt like they've been overcome any day? Yeah, right? We all, we all are subject to this. Why? Because we are enemies of the God of this world. I mean, what? we have to wake up to the spiritual warfare that's around us. We think that it happens like, well, sometimes we think that Satan comes in and he attacks us, you know, and, and then and he sends demons and they all come and they all hit us and attack us. And then they go away for a while and then they come back and hit us again. They ain't never leaving. They don't ever go away. 
sure, he comes in and he attacks with these the, the, these agendas and these plans and these strategic attacks. And, and sometimes they're you know they're mass mounted, but sometimes it's just a daily basis, a daily fight. And that's how he really gets you. Right. Because if you know, if I know, like, for example, right now, we, 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 we just passed. We just passed here out of the season of anger. And now we're passing into the season of depression. OK, that's where that's what Satan's trying to hit us with right now is depression. If we know that and we're forewarned because God gives us the forewarning of that which is to come, we can stand and fight against it because we know it's going to happen. But on a daily basis, he's not going to try to hit you with depression and just depression alone. He's trying to hit you with lust. He's trying to hit you with greed. He's trying to hit you with pride. He's trying to hit you with. See, the demons look at you and they study you and they say, what is your weakness? What is your weakness? I, and that's what I want to exploit. That's why I'm going to keep hitting you at. Because wherever you're weak, the weakest point is that's how you get somebody to fall. So they study you and they attack you with that. Sometimes we think that the problems that we're facing are too big to deal, for us to deal with. It's just too big. I can't handle it. I'm overwhelmed. Or another way of saying it, I'm overpowered or I'm overcome. Are you going to admit defeat? Sometimes we feel like we need to admit defeat, but you've all been trained. You've all been trained. If you feel like you're being defeated, you feel like that you're being overcome, call for backup. Right? The Bible says we're not called to walk alone. We're called to walk together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Like I've said before, you know, Satan has, has power, but he just doesn't have authority. We have power and we have authority, right? So all of a sudden, I mean, I have power in and of myself, but I call uh, 15 of my brothers and sisters, and now all of a sudden those who are walking in righteousness and truth are blood-washed believers, and they come to my aid in the Spirit, praying for me and interceding for me on, on their behalf. Then all of a sudden, when they come in and they begin to fight for me, then all of a sudden I recognize and I know that they come in and the angels come with them, and whatever God orchestrates is able to overcome the enemy. I know they'll flee because the Bible says, well, one, one may ca cause a thousand to flee, two will cause ten thousand to flee. So if I'm outnumbered and I'm outgunned and I'm overwhelmed and they're dogpiling on me and I'm by myself, and let's just say there's a two thousand of them on me, all I need to do is call one brother. And he comes together and stands with me. And now all of a sudden, what? Two thousand? That's it? That's all you got? Man, together we can take care of ten. You want to call somebody else? It's a hundred. We get four, and now we're looking at a million. Bring it. What you got? Right? Do we have to be afraid? No. But we have to let our pride go so that we're not afraid to pick up the phone, call our daddy first, and call our brother second. Amen? So sometimes our circumstances in our life and what we're dealing with. Now, don't get me wrong. When you're dealing with something on a personal basis and on a daily basis and you keep dealing with it day in and day out, I mean, it, it's draining and it's taxing and, it, and it's just, it can be overwhelming if you let it, if you don't keep hold and you don't keep your sight on the big picture. If you don't keep your eyes and your focus on Christ and you allow that to, to kind of overrun you and overtake you, if you start to, you know, literally remember everything that is done in the spirit manifests in the, in the physical, Right? You want to see somebody that's downtrodden? You want to see somebody that's depressed? You want to see somebody that's overwhelmed and that's overcome? Just watch them. Their shoulders come in, their head goes down, and they, 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 there they are. Right? You want to see somebody that's overcome with pride and ego and attitude? Watch one of these little punk kid gangbangers out there. They put the chest out and walk around like their head all cocked back, like, a, you know, like they're the rooster, right? <laughs> that which they're overcome by in the spirit manifests in the physical. And then their mind is attacked and they believe it. We've talked about that before. You know, if you want to be one of those, you know, the people listen to the goth music, right? They listen to that, you know, that, that death music. And, and all of a sudden, they're what? They're painting their faces white and they're wearing black mascara. And all of a sudden, they look like they're emaciated and they don't go out in the sun and they look like the dead. Because that's what they're worshiping. Music is very critical, Right? So we have to only listen to music that which is pleasing to God so that we become like God. I, I, in the, in the, in the self-defense and in self-protection, I always teach that if a guy is like big and muscular, right, 
not necessarily be big, but just muscular, right? If you see a guy that's ripped, you know, and he comes in, and, 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 and everybody's like, oh, man, that dude's strong. He's ripped. You better watch out. I look at it, and I don't say that. I look at it and say, man, I can, but through his muscles and through everything, I can see every point on his body, every weakness is exposed. There's no fat hiding it, <laughs> right? Every weakness is exposed. There's no fat hiding it. I have free access to it. And all, I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, man, he's not too big. He's just too big to miss, right? And so we have to look at spiritually at our problems that way. If our problems are that big to us, we don't look at it and say, man, I can't take care of this. I, I, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I'm not going to be able to deal with this. This is too much for me. No, you just say, man, that problem's so big, how in the world can I not miss it? How in the world can I not attack it and hit it? How in the world can we not come together and overcome it? It's not like it's hiding. Think about David and Goliath. David went out there, you know, as a young boy, relatively speaking. Not, he, was not, he was a warrior, but he wasn't a soldier. The whole entire Israel, uh, army of Israel was cowering before the giant day, uh, Goliath. He went out there, and they were saying, man, that dude is so big, he'll never fall. He's so big, you'll never take him down. He's so big, you know, he's going to kill us all. And they were scared to death. They were shaking. They wouldn't even approach him. And we know David's heart, right? David went out there with the attitude of, how dare this uncircumcised Philistine speak against my God? Does he know who he's messing with? And they said, man, you better back off, David. You better go home because you'll never take him down. He's too big. And he said, yeah, he's too big. Watch this. I get this little rock. He's too big to miss. See, it's a perspective change, isn't it? I'm not worried about the, the, that which is trying to overtake me. If I can see that which is over, trying to overtake me, and if I know what the problem is, then I know the solution. It's when on a daily basis you're overcome with the little things. That's the hard struggle. That's the daily struggles. Those are the ones that get you. If you have the right perspective, then you don't have to worry about being overcome because you know how to overcome it. You know how to conquer it because you know the one who conquered it already. Greater is he who is in the world, no, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So no matter what Satan tries to do, my God is bigger, my God is greater, my God is stronger, my God is mightier, my God is able to save, amen? From Jeremiah 1 and 19 says, they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares Yahweh. Don't ever admit defeat to the enemy. If he kicks you and he gets you and he puts you down, get back up. If you can't get up, call your brother. The Bible says where if one man fallen, there's another, another one's there. To, if they're walking together, then another one will be there to pick him up. If you're trying to walk by yourself and you get knocked down, you can't get back up. That's why fellowship is so important. Amen. That's why we have to have this type of, of structure and we have to have a church and we have to have believers that come together and, and fight together and walk together. It says they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you. But when, God, when will I be victorious? When will I finally get that which I've been praying for? When will it finally come to pass? That's the problem. That's the flesh. And that's what we need. We were singing that song today, I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Are you ready? Or can you wait for God? See, your, your job is not to make what God has in store for you come to pass. Your job is to follow after him until it does. Your job is to walk through the valley and not expect God to cut the valley in half and remove the valley so that you can come out right when you want to. Your job is to walk through the valley until you get through it to the other side. Right? So we have to keep walking and keep trusting and keep believing because it may not be in our timing and it may not most certainly be the way that we think it's going to come to pass. And we certainly sometimes don't understand why we're going through what we're going through, but we know that if we trust God and we keep following him, we keep walking with him and we keep believing in him, we keep obeying him, we keep our faith in him, we know that it will come to pass, that he will work it out for our good. Consider Job. 
every person in the world spoke against him and what he was believing and against God and everything in his life fell apart around him. Then all of a sudden, at the very end, what did it happen that next day when he says, no, God's going to rescue me. God's going to save me. I know I'm right with God. I know everything's okay. Did it happen the next day that all of a sudden he was, he had everything? He had a mansion of gold and fancy cars? No. No. Years. But in the end, God repaid him greater than he ever even expected to be repaid. Let me tell you this, though. The greatest payment you could ever have, regardless of who's coming against you and what's happening in your life, is having the peace of God, the joy of God, and knowing that you're right with God. Amen? Let me tell you something. I've said this before, but man, it's true. When you mess up and you're the guilty one and you did something wrong and you realize you brought all this on yourself, that's, hard, that's 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times harder to deal with than it is if you're innocent and the enemy has come against you. Don't worry, though. I mean, if you, you know, that, thank God for repentance, amen? Thank God for the blood. Because you can repent and turn away from the sins of your past and turn away from the error of your ways and realize that you were wrong and turn back to Christ. And be reconciled unto him. Sometimes see, the reconciliation is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. He'll forgive you overnight, but you still got to pay the consequences daily until it's worked out. But man, if you're feeling the guilt and you're feeling the shame of what you've done, that's a blessing right there. Oh, you, you Think about it. The Bible says, he whom God loves, he chastens. He rebukes and he scourges. Imagine, I, I, please don't do this. Please don't think about, I'm talking about this and I'm just saying, I, well, I'm going to try this. But you know, imagine if you murdered someone and you absolutely felt nothing. That would be worse, wouldn't it? That would be worse. I mean, but if you did something wrong, like, okay, let's, let's minimize it. And let's say you, 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 know, you stole a, you took a piece of gum from somebody and you didn't ask. Right? The pur their purse was left open, the gun was on the table, and you just took it and think, well, I'll take that. Right? Kind of minimal in some people's eyes, but not in God's. It's still theft. So we take that, and now all of a sudden, man, we feel that, oh, man, that's, that. oh, well, I shouldn't have done that. That's wrong. You should count yourself blessed that you have those feelings of it being wrong because you know God loves you, and he's trying to steer you back to the truth and to righteousness. So during the times of persecution, trial, tribulation, during the times when we feel like we're being overcome, during the times when we feel like it's not happening in the time or in the way in which we want it to happen, we have something that we can be doing. There are things, you know, the Bible says we have to talk, we have to go through the refiner's fire because he has to burn off us all these impurities. He has to burn off us all the unbelief. He has to burn off of us. We think sometimes, you know, we look at ourselves and think, man, I'm straight, I'm good. But when he starts burning stuff off, and it starts being painful, and you start, and you start, man, I didn't realize I had that chunk of flesh left. I thought I was, I didn't realize I still had an anger problem. I didn't realize I had deep-seated rejection still. I didn't realize I hadn't done with that, I haven't really dealt with that abuse issue. I just covered it over. I didn't realize, why is that surfacing back up now? See, we, God, when you go through the fire, you say, I thought this was dealt with. I thought this was over. I thought that you thought wrong. The Bible says we have to walk out, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that he's God, he loves us, and he's changing us, transforming us if we follow after him daily. We may not understand it, but he's always right, and he always has what's best in store for us if we just trust him and believe him. Amen? The Bible is at one point says, you know, we have to be willing to, to give up the worthless things in our life. To exchange them for the precious. He says, buy gold from me. God says, buy gold from me. Buy, buy something of value. Buy that which of worth me. Are you not willing to give up this thing for the gold that I'm going to give you? Now remember, the gold he's given us isn't literally gold right now. But the gold that he give us, he's giving us is that intimacy with him. The relationship with him, the power that he gives us, the authority he gives us, the peace he gives us, the joy he gives us, the contentment he gives us, the, the giftings that he gives us to effectuate change and to help others. 
That's the gold we have to buy from him, but we have to be willing to give up the way we think. We have to be willing to give up the things we hold dear to. We have to be willing to give up all those things that are not precious in his sight. We have to be willing to give up all those things that are worthless. He says, give them up and buy gold from me. Yeshua, speaking with his disciples, he says, he speaks to them figuratively all the time, right? And he's trying to teach them, and he's speaking figuratively, and we've talked about the reasoning that he does that, and then he takes it a moment. Now, I, I love this because, you know, it's kind of like, uh, if you liken it to this, you know, he speaks in parables and figurative language the whole time, so let's just say he's speaking like, uh, this is not accurate, but let's just say, for example, he was speaking in um, uh, Old English the whole time, then all of a sudden, he stops speaking, you're trying to discern, and so what, what, you know, you know, he's talking about a torch, and he's talking about this, he's talking about that, and you're like, well, what? Oh, he means a flashlight. So you're trying to figure out what he's talking about the whole time. Then all of a sudden, he takes a moment, he takes a break, he takes a pause, and he says, listen, I'm going to talk plainly to you right now. And that's where we find him right here. And he's talking to his disciples in John 16, 31. Yeshua answered them and says, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. There's lots to tackle here, and I want you to see something we're talking about overcoming on today. The first thing we notice at the end, he says, don't take courage, right? We know what that means. That means literally, through faith, access the courage that I'm going to give you. Access the trust, access the faith, access the courage to overcome. Access that which you need to stand and fight. Access that courage, that, that zealousness for me and my spirit. Access that and take it from me. Take courage and don't be afraid of nothing because I have overcome the world. I am victorious and I am on the inside of you. Therefore, you are going to be victorious if you don't allow the enemy to overcome you, but you overcome the enemy with good or with God. So he says that. But the first thing he says here, he says, he says listen, I told you all these things. And they said, and then he starts speaking to them in plain English. And they said, now, man, now that you're speaking in plain English, everything you're saying is making sense. Now we know that you are God. If anything else that you did, all the miracles you did weren't enough, now for certain we know because you're speaking plainly, you are God. And he says, good, good. Now, do you now believe? Then he says, behold, an hour is coming has already come for you to be scattered. He's talking about whenever he is crucified. He's saying, listen, whenever you're crucified, you're going to be scattered. You're going to be to, to placed. Each one of you is going to go to his own home, and I am going to be left alone. You're not going to be able to follow me into the grave. You're not going to be able to follow me into the tomb. So you're going to be scattered, and we know that's exactly what happened. And he said, each to his own home, you're going to leave me alone. But he says, no, I'm not going to be alone. The Father is going to be with me. He says, but I've spoken this to you so that you know ahead of time what's going to happen. And when you see that which I've said is going to happen, and when you see that which I've said is going to take place, then you'll know that I'm God, and you'll know that if I said it, you're going to overcome, that you'll believe me, and in believing in me, you'll know that you're going to be able to overcome because I overcame. You'll believe that I am the truth, that I am the way, that I am the life. Here's where we get the differentiation, and I think it needs to be made clear to us. You can believe that Christ is the Messiah. But do you believe what he said? Do you believe every word that he spoke? Do you believe the Bible? Do you really stand and believe it? Because it's a lot easier to say, yes, I believe that he's the Son of God. But do you believe every word that has proceeded out of his mouth? See, because if you don't, then the Bible says, then you're making God out to be a liar. And if you make God out to be a liar, then it says he's not in you. So then your belief and your profession of him is baseless, pointless, and worthless. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Amen? Amen? So we believe not only who he is, but we believe what he says. Because what he says is the word. What he says, it says, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. Amen? The word... The living word is Christ. He's the one who spoke everything to existence. He is the word. So we have to believe him. I wanted you to catch, catch that on today. He says, these things I've spoken to you. Now, take that back and just look into the scripture. 
take it as the, the totality of the Bible, these things I have spoken to you. The Bible. I have delivered this Bible unto you. I have spoken these things unto you so that in me you may have peace, knowing that I am God. In the world, you're going to have problems. He's promising, he's guaranteeing us that we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have problems. But again, we have to take that courage and realize he's overcome. That's good news. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God. Another way of saying this is, For this is how we know that we love God and a person loves God, and that they're in relationship with God. That we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God, catch this, whatever is born of God. Now, born of God means whoever is born again overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So another way of saying it, we can overcome the world and all the things of the world and everything that the enemy throws at us, the lies, the guilt, the condemnation, the attacks, the, the, uh, whatever it is. We can overcome those things through our faith. And our faith is the profession of faith that Christ is the Son of the living God and that His Word is infallible, His Word is inerrant, His promises are true, and they are yes and they are amen, that I believe His Word and I stand on His promises and they shall come to pass because He is God and I believe Him. And I believe him not only because I believe what's written, but because I know him because I'm in relationship with him. So he says this, if you're a child of God, if you're born again, blood washed believer, and you're walking in truth and righteousness, you have overcome the world because he is on the inside of you and he overcame the world. That concept is, is difficult to process. It's difficult to process. It, it, can I just give it to you for a, a second? It's kind of like saying this. I, oh, well, this is going to get me in trouble. I can't remember the shows. I'm terrible with shows, but somebody will know what I'm talking about. So let's just say you, you got this mon monsters coming at you, these big, tall, 15-foot, grotesque creatures, and they're coming at you, and you're standing here defenseless. Right here they're coming. They're coming with weapons. They're coming with tech and stuff that's greater than, you know, that you don't have. And you're standing, you're thinking to yourself, all right, how in the world am I going to fight all these bad dudes off? How in the world am I going to? They're clearly, they have, they're clearly more advanced than me. They're clearly more powerful than me. They clearly have all the armament. They have everything. I don't have a thing. How in the world am I? I'm not. I know I'm going to be over, overwhelmed. I know I'm going to be overcome. I know this. So now what do I do? So Christ is saying here, well, listen, if you're born again, I dwell and I live on the inside of you. So now this is where I get in trouble because this is not how you're supposed to picture Christ, but just picture like you have a little Christ on the inside of you, right? He's literally dwelling on the inside of you. I remember there was one where there's like an animation. No, an animation. It was like a little something where they hit the button and a little thing. Is, oh, I think it's like Men in Black, I think. And so the little dude lived on the inside. That's what it was, <laughs> right? And so that little dude on the inside was a bad little dude, right? Now, Christ, the creator of the universe, dwells on the inside of you. And he says, hey, listen, don't worry about this. I got it. I got him. I'm all powerful. I'm all knowing. I'm all places at all times, and I'm on the inside of you. I got this. I can take care of it. I've already kicked their butts. I've already taken them out. I've already defeated hell. I've already defeated the grave. I've already defeated Satan. I've already defeated all the demons. And here I am, and I'm on the inside of you. Just call on me. Just believe and ask in faith. Take courage. Don't bow down. Don't cower down. Don't back away. Don't shrink back. Don't believe what they're saying about you. Don't believe the lies. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Keep your eyes fixed on me and know I'm on the inside of you. Take courage. I've overcome them. I'm victorious. So are you because I'm in you. Amen? If you're thinking about being overcome, I want to kind of close with this on today. It's interesting, interesting to me. Remember I told you to hold fast that, that, that in the definition, the, uh, the archaic term, um, where it says um, that uh, we'll be overspread. You know, in the millennium. Well, let me read this scripture first, and then I'll talk about it. Revelation 21, verse 9 through 11. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, 
Now, who's the bride? The church, the saints, right? The ones who are born again, the, 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 the flock, the little flock. I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So that's us. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. So they're great and high. So it's a huge, very tall, high mountain. And they're looking down now. And showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone and as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, this is taking note and this is making reference to the holy city of Jerusalem coming down literally out of heaven. Coming directly from God with the glory of God still upon Jerusalem, still upon this holy city. This is happening upon the new heaven and upon the new earth, right? After the other things have been destroyed, this is now being put, taken, put in place there. But I submit to you that even when the Christ returns and we're raptured up, we go up to meet him in the air, we come down that very same day, we come down and we're now in Jerusalem for the millennium reign of Christ. The scripture tells us the, 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 the kind of the confines of Jerusalem, how high the walls will be, that we know that it will be a heavenly Jerusalem that we will inhabit in our spiritual bodies. So we know that the Jerusalem, I just want, I thought this was pretty cool, I thought that the Jerusalem that we know and see today that's war-torn and scattered, Israel that's all plagued with enemies all surrounding her now on all sides, and with bombs being bursted into her. The walls say that you know, they're not going to be able to get their bombs in, their mortars in, their missiles in. Everything's going to be completely you know, rendered uh, ineffective and harmless. It's going to be like a, you know, a, a gnat trying to attack a, a, a shark. You know? It's just not going to happen. And so <laughs> here, here they are. So all of a sudden, well, how does this city all come about? It's a heavenly Jerusalem that ascends and it comes down from God and will come upon the earth and we will dwell in it. It will overcome the war-torn Jerusalem that stands today. And the archaic term, once again, it will overspread. Take the place of. So you see, God's going to overcome if we let him. Amen? It doesn't mean we don't have to fight. Because you have to fight. It just means you have to go to fight with him. And you have to let him lead the fight. Amen? Amen. All in all, here's what has to happen. Here's the key to victory. You have to allow God to overcome you. You have to allow him to conquer you. You have to submit to him every place in your being. The Bible says, present yourself as a living sacrifice unto God. To present yourself that way. Let him overcome you. If he overcomes you and you have his glory, you have his power, you have his authority, you're walking in righteousness and you're walking in love, how many people are you going to be able to save? How many people are you going to talk to? And how much more powerful, how much more... Effective are you going to be in your daily walk when the enemy comes at you if you've already been overcome by God? When you think about it that way, and you say, listen, man, I ain't got nothing to worry about. God's already conquered me. He's already defeated my flesh. The demons are already gone outside of me. I've, I've been, I'm, I'm born again. I'm blood washed. I'm walking and I'm working out. I might have some stuff left, but I've submitted fully and completely. I now present myself to him completely and utterly. Now I've taken courage. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid of what Satan's going to do to me. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of those who are attacking me. I'm not afraid of the people that's surrounding me, the enemies, my naysayers. I'm not afraid of what the devil's speaking and the lies that he's perpetuating, the attacks that are coming. I'm not concerned about that anymore. I'm concerned with pleasing him. I'm concerned with making my daddy happy. I'm concerned with being a help to my brothers and sisters. I'm concerned with lifting them up, interceding for them, encouraging them, and walking together. Amen? We have to stand together until his return and fight for one another until his return. And we have to allow him to overcome us daily until his return, until he overcomes this world with a new Jerusalem in which we will inhabit with him. Amen? Amen. Again, as we come to the last scripture, 
Revelations 12 and 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God or with good. Amen? I hope this brings greater clarity to you today on what it means to be an overcomer. Let me tell you something. It's not just about getting an emotional high and getting pumped up and saying, yeah, I'm an overcomer. Woohoo! I'm an overcomer. I believe it. I believe I'm an overcomer. That ain't enough. You're not an overcomer unless you've been overcome by God. Amen? As you stand.